Hello and welcome to the Annie Altman Show, the podcast, season five. Welcome to the fifth episode in the Choice series. Today, I am so grateful to be here with Christina Nahara of the founder of The Stripper Project. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Hey, thanks for having me. Thank you uh, for being patient with the getting started here. Yeah. <laughs> I would love for you to introduce the, the project and say a little bit about yourself in your own words. Okay. Um, well, the Stripper Project um, started as an interdisciplinary art project. Um, I am inspired by people in the industry. I've been in the industry for 10 years and um, I wanted to show the multifaceted spaces and um, what started as a film project has now kind of blossomed into um, kind of an educational based um, community uh, platform. So uh, yeah, it's an ever evolving, um, ever functioning space. You know. I love that it started with art as the seed and then from there has the flexibility and the space to expand and there's the podcast and there's Stripper Church and there's all of these different ways that using art to make more communities to make art and come together and express and support. Yeah. Yeah. I felt like one thing that really um, we are encouraged as women and also um, especially women in sexual power, we're encouraged not to interact with each other. We're taught how to fight amongst each other. We're taught how to compete with each other. And um, the beautiful thing is, is I've never met more inspiring, magnificent people as I have in the sex industry. Um, and I felt like they all had to meet each other. So it's building community and creating platforms to do that. Yeah. Mm to uplift each other rather than that so real of stepping into your own sexual power. Thank you so much. And speaking of community and women and humans uplifting humans, being, being brought coffee here, that, that you brought to go directly against something that is seeking to divide and minimize that power and say, oh, well, if we keep you all separate from you stepping into your own power, then we can play it down and we can yeah, it's yeah. another way of controlling it. And you're saying, okay, or we could come together and we can all support each other. And not even about it being like power grabs or like, oh, who's the more powerful? Well, I definitely come from a space of abundance. Like there's enough for everyone. And um, I mean, there's definitely a space where we need to, um, you know, let voices that are marginalized speak louder and have bigger platforms because we need to hear them um and also like everyone's voice is powerful there is enough for everyone and if we come at it where i'm not um i'm taking up my own space because i'm in my, my own power and i'm also able to listen then um we're able to build a bigger stronger community yes oh i really love that language uh, of the the both between claiming your own space and being open to to hearing to parts of that being malleable. I I would love to hear more too about the the abundance mindset and that whole like there's so many ways people talk about this with law of attraction or I get very food basic resource distribution focused on abundance mindset of there's enough food on the planet literally for everyone there's enough places for everyone to sleep that what like what do you to bring this to choice or to start to connect that in here is that a choice for you to choose the abundance mindset is that a way your mind always was working or a way that felt natural to you whatever natural uh, is? I don't think so I think that um I've worked really hard in my life um and I've made the choice to um kind of create the life that I wanted. But I feel like when I, I stopped comparing myself to others and I started living fully in myself and knowing, um, you know, uh, 
something like sex work is really hard because you could have a $8,000 night and the next day it's 10. And um, it's um, so inconsistent that it can put people in this scarcity mindset where they feel like they're competing amongst each other. Um, and thankfully, I worked at a space where um, there was a lot of powerful women that would inspire each other and work with each other and create um, relationships. And I feel like when I choose to show up, um, as if my opportunities aren't being stolen from me, but I'm creating my opportunities, um, then I usually make more money. <laughs> and I usually get to have fun with my friends. So. Mm. When it's like the remembering that you make your choices, that you're creating it for the another, another of the C's. Like that yeah. you're, you're the yeah, one. Yeah. Also, I have a lot of white privilege, so I have a lot of more opportunity when I'm standing in a crowd. Portland's a very white space, and um, the strip clubs, a lot of them can be discriminating towards women of color. So, I mean, a lot of things, like that's a privilege. I'm white passing. Um, I can speak English well, and, um, you know, I have a pretty face. So there's a lot of... Um, privileges that I hold, you know, that aren't necessarily choices, but were, you know, things that were, that I'm just uh, have to acknowledge my privilege and in stepping into that, you know, because I think that the whole like um, abundance space of looking at things, yes, there is plenty for everyone. And also not a lot of people get those opportunities. Um, so using a platform to help encourage um equality i think is incredibly important and also just acknowledging my own privilege you know because i can you know talk about abundance all day long and it is things that really help me you know because comparing myself and um trying to compete that's where things can get really convoluted in the industry so um choose i think not choosing that and choosing to create teamwork and um yeah is my ultimate choice <laughs> yeah it does it takes so much energy towards competing that you're then not having towards listening to yourself and figuring out your own needs and and even taking the time to sit down and say well wait these things that i was born into weren't choices and also how do i choose to acknowledge them and how does acknowledging them impact my life and then the other choices I make to then help uplift other voices that didn't have those same thing, like that also didn't make a choice about where they were born or mm -hmm. things about how they were born or yeah, ugh, it gets so into the, the, the part where my head goes just like, Oh, paradox, humaning, what's going on is the, what is, what is our choice and what isn't. And then, how do we really acknowledge all of it? And that sounds so, can sound like so cliche or so like, how do you step into your power? What does that even mean to acknowledge the yeah. whole picture? Um, well, I think for me uh, in my space, um, I've definitely uh, made mistakes in, in, you know, just, acknowledging my own privilege or I, I mean, for me personally, I'm, I was a single mom. Like I raised my child. I mean, I have a partner now. Um, but I, you know, moved from across the country to here. And I also like have a really shitty family. So all of these things were things that I was, you know, I could hold on to. Right. And those are choices for me, you know, I could take those and use them as fuel to say that my life is a certain way. Um, but I made a different choice. Like I used something like sex work to empower my life, to fund my partner's business, to fund a, a project where we traveled around the country and heard people in all aspects of the sex industry. Um, and those were choices for me, you know, um, 
for sure. But I, uh, what I also wanted to accomplish in making um, this project and acknowledging what women or people in this industry go through, especially black and brown people, um, there's so much that I had to be a better listener to and to open my eyes on how I could be a better advocate and a support to, um, to my people that were right in front of me, you know, that I wasn't acknowledging their experience. And that's what um, was really eye opening and transformative in this whole project was really um, listening you know, choice, another choice, like listening, just shutting my mouth and listening. That's been a huge lesson. <laughs> yeah, I feel that that was part of my starting the podcast was to practice that really hearing. And, and that part of that goes back to the first thing you were saying of people getting intimidated by humans stepping into their sexual power and seeking to divide that. And and then creating that that dynamic where it's more challenging or where then maybe it doesn't feel as safe, as easy for people to share and for people to really listen and say, Hey, I'm on your team. We're we're on the same mm -hmm. we're on the same team here. And also like you were saying of the people right there, I I I can definitely relate to that. And I feel like a lot of people can too, that it's it can be the people right closest to us or right next to us or who are right there and I wonder if that's part of the discomfort then of really sitting with their discomfort and being like, I'm, I'm here to, to know that I don't know all of those cliches of part of privileges that you don't fully ever conceptualize privilege because you've only had a privileged experience. Mm -hmm. So how, like, then where do we go from there in terms of how to really we, we make art about it and we talk about it and we create spaces for people to, to put it out there. Those are, those are my best ideas currently for it. Right. I, I think that it's acknowledging our privilege, but it's also like realizing where white supremacy actually, like where we, the patriarchy and white supremacy will make us think this is guy. Um, I thought well, make us think that we don't have a choice. And those are the things that we as a community and uh, culturally need to start acknowledging. And just because it's easy for us to do certain things or not to acknowledge certain things, um, it, it means that it's making someone else's life harder, um, particularly black and brown people. So it's just like things like that, acknowledging our privilege is one thing, but then taking action to change um, to change our own behavior. Because I mean, honestly, we can only start with us. And I, we all like have we all have um, our space, and we all have our um, like what we're good at, what our little niches are. I feel like every little human being. Like I have met so many activists doing this and um some that are, like kat salas is one of them here in portland she is just so inspiring and on top of it and always in her work and always working for um the greater good of people and when i met her i was like oh, that is an activist you know because her heart like her whole entire heart is in what she is doing and how she's doing things. Um, and I think that is really powerful. Um, I also know that like for me, I was like, how do I give and how do I create and how do I do these things? And I'm such a community based person, you know, like um, I am uh, such a role in the life of my family and the life of the people around me. Um, and yeah, and, and intrinsically, the way that I express is through art. So um, working, I, my husband filmed the stripper project um, and I directed it. So, um, it was this like, I mean, heart of love of just giving to 
people that um, I wanted to hear their story. You know, I'm, I'm intrinsically a storyteller. So um, yeah, it's all of those things. And then also like for me right now, like what I'm going through, I see all of these things going on in Portland and I'm like, fuck man, like how do I effectively support people in this community um, with, also supporting myself and supporting my child and my mother and my partner and you know like all these people that are so dear and important to me and um so yeah during a pandemic and i know everyone's going through it but it's like um yeah it's at the height of my mind you know? yeah oh yeah the the extra heaviness of how it's in a lot of ways challenging a lot of this abundant scarcity mindset personally and collectively and how we're navigating what is there. Thank you for bringing up and directly addressing because it also is for all of the very real buzzwords of white colonial settler patriarchy. All of these things are being so highlighted right now of saying we've had structures that have purposely divided people that have kept them in places of feeling scarcity so that they make choices based out of scarcity and yeah yeah and I mean it's very I, real right now of everything that has happened like we can sit and talk about it and also like you're saying what do we actually do now what are the steps that how do we how do we yeah. all change our collective choices now I yeah I mean I think that it's listening to black leaders honestly at this point um, I am, you know, when I, cause I'm still in the process of moving out of the sex industry and things like that. I still have people that are, you know, sugar daddies and things like that. And, um, I encourage them to like donate when they're giving, instead of gifts, like, you know, oh, but the ACLU, you know, <laughs> and it's important. We distribute uh, the funds. Direct. Yeah, money in the way that it needs to be directed. Do I really need another purse? No, I don't. I would much rather you just buy this or, you know, whatever it is. Um, because there's this whole, you know, spoiling aspect, which is really powerful um, to understand, you know, my own privilege and to use it in ways that are going to benefit a greater community. And also in big ways, um, I have to like, this is, like COVID has changed my whole um, aspect. Like I've lost so much financial backing through, um, you know, through this project for myself, for my family um, and having to lean heavily into my partner to, um, for support financially and mentally and emotionally and have my child home, you know, all the time. Like my life has completely transformed, you know, when I was, uh, before COVID um, was happening, I was working four to six nights a week and, you know, maybe getting four to six hours of sleep a day and um, just grinding, just grinding. And um, that, I mean, COVID has taught me a lot of things, um, how, probably how ineffective something like that is, but um, I have always been a climber, you know, I've always been someone who wants the next step and the next step. So um, COVID is really helping me to understand, to be appreciative for the things that I have. Um, and that That's everything- so little sleep. <laughs> so I, sorry to interrupt, that everything what? Oh, and that everything can go away tomorrow. Like what is actually important? Where do I need to spend my time? Yeah. Mm. Oof. that that choice is is more valuable maybe of where we give our time and energy then it, it's easy to overlook for all of us mm -hmm. the, the value of our own choice the, and our own like where we're choosing the value of our choice and the value of where we're choosing we're to like spend our time yeah that was, that was a huge yeah. thing that's that a big shift yeah mm -hmm. so like because that i mean there's there's a line here too of also like where is the part of 
of you and me and anyone that participates in grind culture because they really love what they're doing and they're excited about doing things and they're passionate about it. And where is the part where I, I'll speak definitely from my experience of where I feel like, oh, this is coming from this place of some sort of scarcity of like a need for some sort of financial or other tangible it, like stability for an emotional stability like oh am I doing this to to fill a like wh where is this choice coming from really and then yeah. well I mean for me I so I um have been raising my child by myself until she was about two um and then I had a partner and my partner um was working somewhere and I was dancing and I was like all right well we have to I could make more money you go to work and I will uh, I'll work you know or you stay home and I'll go to work so I was working a lot like six nights a week and making a lot of money because it's very lucrative but um what people don't understand is that it's very challenging work and it's constant it's hard on your body it's hard on your heart it's hard in your spirit. Um, you're constantly getting rejected in all these different ways. And also being objectified is like, um, you know, it, it's like, it's an interesting space because sex workers are, you know, they're valiant. Like they're just, they're constantly in the space of like, I got this, I got this, I got this. And then sometimes it just hits you the wrong way. And you're like, fuck, I'm going to kill someone. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's like, a, you know, it's just the right time, the right space can get you all, you know, a bad night. So um, I'm just working really hard and my partner is staying home with my child and taking care of our home and um, just being an incredible partner and also, you know, starting a business. And through this space and through this time of working, um, it just gets you into this like, okay, we have to do this, you know, I have to get my child to the next space. I have to get my partner to the next space. You know, I don't come from a wealthy family. I've never had anyone, uh, you know, I've had a really tumultuous space with my, um, with my family. So I, I've never had financial or emotional or um, any sort of support. I've always, you know, if I needed something, I did it, you know, and I started working two jobs, like a night job and a day job when I was 18 years old and I just haven't really stopped. And then having a child and being in a really um, bad relationship and needing to get out, like dancing was such a fucking key for me, you know? Um, and that's how it's been used since, um, you know, since I went back, I danced when I was younger and I was a wild beast and then, you know, jumped back in. But the choices change when uh, I felt like for me, when I had a child. Yeah. Mm. And you, and then you were thinking about and feeling about their choices and their opportunities for choices. Right. Then, I mean, just the hustle changed, you know, my choice of how I interacted in a club setting, what choices I made. Um, you know, I decided at some point, cause I was just so fucking exhausted that I would try different kinds of sex work. Um, and you know, in good and bad, I've had an incredible experiences and I've had really traumatic experiences. Um, and thankfully, I uh, made it out on the other side, <laughs> you know, but it I wouldn't have really created the risk is high, but the reward is higher. That's how I always felt for me, because if I can make, um, you know, seven grand a week or more, and I can supply my child with A, B, and C, and I can also, you know, be able to create this project that I've um, been needing and wanting and, you know, and then also like support a home, support a family. All of those things are so important to me. So it's, um, 
it always, it, of course it is a choice, but it, it sometimes never feels like a choice for me. I was writing down when you said keys, I loved you talking about it being a key because you were just talking so much there about ways of you supporting and showing up for people and the stripper project. Mm -hmm. So much of that is supporting and creating spaces to support and give, give space to other people. And also the, all of the cliches and I'm reminding you to remind myself of then how, how do you support you and doing like give, give uh, I mean, me and my therapist talk about it all the time so yeah. <laughs> um oh, i mean well, I, I push my push, push my glasses up here <laughs> yeah. um yeah said, I, like in some ways it was what i was hearing was like you said like that you used the word key and so that felt like you choosing your own key and like your own like you mm -hmm. chose a key for you so that that felt like yeah. you were doing something in mm -hmm. you for you. Um, well, I mean, honestly, sex work to me is like a fucking fuck you to the patriarchy because uh, for me, it's always been like, you, you're going to tell me that I'm unworthy. You're going to wait. You're going to sexualize me since I'm as a young child. Like, uh, I mean, my my situation in sexuality, like there has been a lot of abuse. And when I decided to do um, sex work, it was a huge fuck you. Like, yeah, fuck you. You will pay me and you will give me what's mine. And if you don't, I'm going to make sure that like I am still on top. And I mean, I still chose what I do. You know, there. I'm not a survivalist sex worker. I chose to do this. I know that because of the way that I look, I could have gone and done anything else. But the reality is I could have been in a law office where people are fucking sexualizing me and then I'm crying about it at night. Or I could go to a strip club, make $2,500 in a fucking night and slap them if they fucking touch me. Like, you know, or get them kicked out or, you know, I just had like I sometimes I say the most ridiculous things to people because I don't give a fuck who you think you are. Like you are in my house now and now you will listen to my rules. And that's honestly what the most powerful thing for me about being a stripper and starting in, in sex work in that way because um that was like my choice to create that space. And um, I, again, why I fucking started the stripper project is because I could not watch these women over and over again, not see themselves because they are so fucking powerful and illuminated and just, um, they are so inspiring to be around. And it, is at all aspects. It's not just, cause there's, I mean, I am not individualized in the space of like grinding my fucking ass off and having a child and building a project. And there is women in this industry that are doing it over and over and over again, and they need to be acknowledged. And also like the stigma on top of them, the society and culture will tell you, oh, you know, because again, the patriarchy plays on it over and over again. If we can take away the power of women and sexuality, then we own them. Then they listen to us. Then we can be something that's important. We can be in power. And they do that through fear. They do that through stigma. They do that through violence. All of those things. And fuck, I mean, fuck yeah, sex workers. I just like most powerful beings I've ever met. Just mm. like powerhouse to so powerfully hold up a, a mirror to all of those things you're saying and saying you want to sexualize us and take away our sexual power at the same time? Excuse, excuse me? Yeah. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's so funny. Like, I, I just think that that is just so um, disempowering. Like, you know, to, it, I mean, I could, I've been there before. I've never, I, I mean, before I got into the industry, I was like, oh my gosh, I could never be a stripper. And then 
I became a stripper and everything was wonderful. And I felt empowered and I was around these women that fucking saw me and they saw who I was and they understood me and they didn't have to, I didn't have to be something else or pretend something else or pretend like I didn't like sex or pretend like I was naughty or bad or, you know, and I could talk about like very vulnerable, hurtful things that had happened and they got it. They understood it wasn't bad. And, you know, I mean, eventually I got a therapist and, you know, I'm working through my own things, you know, but it, it's still, has been super empowering to be in such an open space and an open community. Mm, Totally. Yeah. Shout out to therapy and also to having group spaces for group therapy or art therapy or in some ways, a lot of what we're doing is go ahead. I'm sorry. That's what we're doing with the stripper project is the stripper project is a collective of human beings that have a lot of knowledge because that's also what I have I've realized during this process of traveling the country and meeting all of these women from different aspects is that, or people, um, you know, I don't want to disinclude anyone that, you know, is non-binary or whatever. Um, but people in the sex industry, um, it's just such an empowering thing because we can teach each other. We can learn from each other. We can grow and listen from the aspect of coming together. So, you know, on Sundays, we call it stripper church because we just, honestly, we started because we all got together and started drinking mimosas and we're like, we have to fucking talk about this shit. Um, and to be able to sit in a group with people that understand, like, you know, um, I just had someone last night, uh, pay me $450 in the champagne room to like, you know, for him to lick the bottom of my foot, you know, it's like something like that. Like, and those are exciting moments. And in, because of what we do, we don't get to celebrate like everyone else gets to celebrate their career and their space. And to have a space where we can get together and be like, ah, this is so great. And it's so funny. And everyone's okay with it. And there's no one in this group that's going to shame me or make me feel bad or make me feel like I don't belong because um, of this experience that I had or this choice that I made. Um, that is why, uh, you know, stripper church and we do, you know, art therapy and yoga and everyone does different sessions and, um, offers what they can. And it's a not-for-profit space. Yeah. I loved what you said too about it of you were seeing these, these people who weren't seeing themselves and you were like, Hey, recognize your own worth and power and what you have here and also legitimize it like sex sex work is work why would people not have a, in the same way people want to talk about whatever work that they're doing with other people who understand that work and other people who they love it, it, it's another like it's the same of it's like of course we need spaces of course people need that outlet to to connect with communities mm-hmm. But because of all of these other layers of the stigma, oh, let's all pretend like like we didn't all come into existence because of two people having sex. And so we're just not going to talk about it. Right. But I mean, that's the thing is, uh, I mean, when we do start to create spaces, they're taken away from us. You know, like when FOSTA SESTA came out, that was a, uh, a bill that really restricted the connection of sex workers and the internet and yes some of them like you know i don't give two flying fucks how people make their money that is their business and whether they do it over the internet at least they can screen people and be safe um and uh you know attaching sex trafficking to sex work are the two completely different aspects but if we had a more open space and an open dialogue with sex workers and we decriminalize sex work, then people that were in parts and spaces that were unsafe could go to the authorities, um, whatever that might be at some point in the future, and get help. <laughs> um, and so it's just like, um, like this constant space 
of trying to separate. And because of FOSTA-SESTA, not only did it shut down aspects of people's work, it also has gone in and shut down spaces where people could openly talk about sex work. And that's not okay. That's not okay in any sort of way. And also blocking women from, you know, Instagram platforms and Twitter platforms and fucking Facebook and all of these things where um, we can't even connect. We can't even say things. We can't even be in those safe spaces. So, um, I mean, we're resilient. Like we're going to be around forever. Sex work is the oldest mm -hmm. profession and it will continue regardless. It doesn't matter how people like try and stop it. It's going to happen and we will find a way. Um, and if the stripper church is in any sort of way a help or a um, lifting of our community, fuck yeah, we're going to go all the way. And there's so many other spaces that are popping up. Um, the Portland stripper strike, like so fucking powerful. Um, and um, Giselle Marie, New York, she's in New York and she is building spaces for black sex workers. Um, there is just so much that is like happening right now. And I'm just so proud of the community standing up and doing their fucking part to create what needs to happen. Such another great a a advocate and uh, activist, Giselle Marie, amazing. I'm just also so inspired by like her movements and um, how she supports this community so big and powerful and stands for black sex workers in such a big way. Yeah. Mm. A lot of choices. It's so many compounded. Yeah. And faced with the choice, that's the thing that makes sex workers so powerful. When faced with the choice, they always fucking choose each other and they always choose community. They always choose their families. I don't know how many people that I know that are supporting their entire family. Like when I'm like, oh yeah, I pay all my bills and I did, like I am not fucking unique in this industry. These are the biggest hearted people that are supporting their moms, they're supporting their brothers, they're supporting their children, they're supporting their partners, they're supporting, you know, their uncles, their aunts, their cousins. Like there are so many people that are in support, just like in fucking ancient times, like the sex industry built Rome and Greece in all these huge ways. Like they try and hide history, but it's really powerful and it's really clearly seen that a huge part of the community and um, what was being built then is still here. Like sex workers are a huge part of the ec economic structure of what happens. We are just not given the title or the space. And I mean, again, more space of like why I want to start the Sugar Project. I'm like, let's just fucking rule the world. Let's tear down the clubs and build our own. <laughs> we'll make our own spaces then. Where, because the other part of freedom, freedom of speech is blocked in so many ways that then because of all of the same root stigma against sex that people don't want to... When we spoke before recording, you talked about people facing their own sexuality and that part of this too, where then like. Just my cousin. <laughs> Sorry, well, what were you All good, all good. Talking about community and people and supporting that it's the, the resilience that you were talking about to still choose community and to choose to collaborate, to support, to, to acknowledge, which then is so much more challenging in the face of free speech literally being withheld and taken away and, and platforms being not even admittedly, like not even admitting that things are being shadow banned and the literal internet gaslighting and all these ways that people are minimizing the experiences like you're saying of people who are a there's a huge economic structure like people want to take it apart from these quote tangible like no it's not related to the economy or there aren't people who are being supported by sex work and who are just acting like there's just there's so much collective being like no this isn't happening no we just can't talk about it and and it's so inspiring to see see something like the stripper project that's like hey 
we're here we're having fun we're loving each other we're putting it out there we're we're calling out calling in we're we're not hiding from mm-hmm. we're not hiding from this we're not acting like we're not going to pretend like sex work is it we know that sex work is criminalized to keep us separate and we're still going to come together and talk about that mm-hmm. that's that's powerful and we're going to bring in the spaces of people being even more minimized to or we're going to we're going to uplift those people even more because we're noticing that and we're going to acknowledge that too mm-hmm. it is like yeah. you were saying of like break down these other structures and have a new yeah i mean it's resilience it's like um i yeah i definitely um like my family is from Mexico, my mom and her family, and um, my dad is everything white. And like the difference in the understanding of the world is so, so vast. Like, um, and it's been so, like my dad's family is just very toxic and very abusive towards themselves and each other. And, Um, my mom, no matter what she has ever been through, like, that's how I would describe her is resilient because that's what, I mean, unfortunately, and maybe fortunately, like, um, like Chicano people are very fucking powerful because of the life that they've had to create, like, and because of surviving in spaces where um i mean even things i have to break down now of like white white passing and like being like having some sort of shame or fear to like embrace certain parts of myself and my culture um like those are like white supremacy in me that i have to like start breaking down in huge ways you know um and acknowledging the 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 resilience and the struggle that um yeah that my family's gone through and been through you know it's just like so so crazy and both my uh or my grandfather came over here illegally you know um and to i think that we are all a lot closer to um to changing things than we would like to believe. Um, But the changing and the transformation starts with our own selves and our own work, the daily um, acknowledgement, the daily forgiveness, the daily um, acceptance, um, and the action that goes into um, those like little minute details, you know? I think the macro can get really overwhelming but if we start on the micro space and we, we just start by, you know, like I have a almost six year old and like we're learning Spanish together and that's really powerful <laughs> for me. And e- even though like I understand Spanish is a colonized, um, you know, it's a colonized language too, because that's not like, um, that's not native to Mexico, but it's also getting us closer and closer to spaces that um, are home. And um, then she can like have time and conversations with my mom who really wants to speak Spanish to her and like learn those things and learn traditions and start giving um, to bigger, more profound spaces and, you know, our community expanding. Like um, it's really empowering and also my responsibility to teach my daughter um, that the world is bigger than, um, you know, than what she sees and to also let her know like what's going on. Like she asked me questions about, you know, what's going on right now. And um, like, why is everyone, why is everyone so upset? And I'm like, because people are treating black and brown people unfairly because they're not loving them as intensely. And to explain that to a five, six year old um, and to have her comprehend, you know, fuck the police, you know, I just, (laughs) 
Yeah. You know, it's like, it's such a, um, that's, that's a huge job for me. That's it. That's a, a space where I have to bring her in to a bigger space than I could ever be. And do in doing that, that means that I have to put on my own fucking face mask first, which means that I have to be in study. I have to be in conversation. I have to be listening and, and acknowledging my own white supremacy and then dismantling it within myself and the choices that I make and um, being better every day, mm. at least trying <laughs> and then fucking it up and then trying again. <laughs> yeah. Yep. The classic human making, making choices that lead us towards healthier, whatever healthy is choices or choices that feel more more like us and that's part of that resiliency you're you're talking about of to to choose to keep making choices and to say i can i can still contribute to the world that i want to live in i can still choose whether or not i'm going to acknowledge what it cut out of course like for me like the the worlds that i want to live in yes but it's also like for what the- kind of world for her you know like what kind of world am I building for the community after me and I think that is a huge aspect of um especially as Americans that we don't acknowledge I mean we're like so focused like how can I make this life great like the American dream blah 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 but it's also just like what am I leaving for her how am I what is my legacy and what um what am I actually grasping at? Like, what am I trying to create? So, and my, I mean, my daughter is, was born a a male and identifies as a female and has since she was two years old. Um, And uh, like, I think of things like that. Like, um, I know, like, I'm just so proud of the generation that's coming after us and all this gender, normality stuff that has just really plagued the whole patriarchy because if we can separate and sever from that space oh well you're boy so first of all you can't feel and you need to express in this way and everything needs to be about war and everything needs to be about violence and you know like boy 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 oh you're a girl and you're soft and you're beautiful and you're like just allowing the normalities of gender to be whoever the fuck she wants to be because she claims it like she teaches me every day how to be a fucking better person (laughs) you know that is like so powerful Mm. just through the choices that she's making and just just doing her just be like choosing to her like she chooses herself and she's just like this is what and i mean of course we have like you know okay, you can't eat fruit ups for dinner kind of thing. She has, she's still a kid, but I just mean in the aspect of like, um, you know, like what she wears, how she identifies herself. Like these are choices that she, um, I mean, I don't necessarily think that being trans is a choice, um, but she chooses to express it to us and she chose to acknowledge it and she chose to um, create who she, she chose to be brave enough to like, you know, and thankfully, like, she has an incredible support team around her. And I'm so um, grateful, like, uh, my brother and my mom live up here, my cousin and her cousin live here and my partner. And um, I had this like, devastating space of like my dad and his family like completely rejecting me but then building up my own aspect of community and support around myself and around people that actually saw me and I'm so grateful for that opportunity because it allowed me to be a mom that could listen you know and not that I'm a perfect mom but um I'm grateful that she felt comfortable enough to be herself you know that that makes me so happy Mm -hmm. and that does say that there were a lot of choices that you made in the structures you made in the communities and the 
the people you surrounded yourself with and how you were interacting with her that supported her being able to choose herself and choose to be honest and choose that that requires safety and stability and community and resilience you know resilience is is great and at a certain point we people also need that that safety that security to say i can, hmm? right i mean we all need that i think that's a huge thing in like um with what you're with the stripper project to come back like yeah well yeah because resilience is one thing but we can all like fight the fucking battle for so long but we need to be allies and we also need comforting we need homes like everyone needs a safe home to be in you know and when we're constantly like oh well you're brave or you're big like i i mean i saw this quote about black women the other day because i mean how just so much is pushed on to black women you know to be strong to be resilient to be all these things and um you know it's good to be all of those things and also we need to leave space yeah we need to leave space to create softness and that loving tenderness and also not expect people to constantly you know like expect black women to always have to be resilient give them and protect them and take them in and create more for them yeah mm. yes and just have some expectation that people are going to just quietly and happily be okay with the, the world being inequitable and that you would expect people to just keep being resilient and keep doing extra right and this is where yeah. the community comes in too to, to be there when yeah, we, everyone only has so much emotional, physical, spiritual, all the bandwidth. Right. You know, it's all also, infinite. And this whole, uh, this whole thing, this whole Black Lives Matter is not just a Black issue. It's not just a Brown issue. It's an everyone issue because um, we can't, we can't just stand by, you know, that's, that's silence. And it, I mean, we are taught to be silent. We are taught, like I, I mean, I was raised in an evangelical freaking Christian, you know, like I was taught to be subservient um, and like break the rules, like break the system, burn the system down. Like it, we're done, we're done with this. I love that even with the resilience and the loving of like, break it down, we're done here. Goodbye, lots of love. Like. <laughs> That's how I feel all the time. I mean, the biggest thing, like my ultimate goal with this uh, sugar project and how this whole thing started, um, I mean, eventually what we'll get to and where we'd like to lead is co-op strip clubs where people can be in spaces and own their own. And also like, why are we still so fixated on gender? Can we just get a bunch of beautiful people in like a big space and like still be appreciated i don't know it's led by the patriarchy i i maybe it's wishful thinking or hoping but you know we're definitely in the process of talking and collaborating and um manifesting uh this this big ideas big ideas so um it's coming it's all coming it's just percolating right now Ooh, i can feel it see it i can yeah, it seems like a, like a duh, like, of course, how does that space not exist yet? What, like, what are we doing humans? Like, why aren't there 12 of these spaces? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm and, so... I don't know, probably around the world there is. I don't know. I haven't heard of any yet, but we'll see. It's percolating <laughs> and starting. Yeah. I'm so excited to see, yeah, I'm excited to see one, one day and to see how it all continues it all continues. It is all of the social justice issues to me, all social things are all connected and tied and it certain like part of part of then how stuff goes is like what? Like when you pull the string, like it all comes unraveled when you start pulling the string because when you start to pull the string, you realize that it's all the same structure. 
and that we are all in this like fucking game in this rat race that was created for us instead of by us and that's like where where like we have to recognize like it's all yeah it's mm. all the same yeah yes and we get to create the structure we can we can choose it but first we have to acknowledge how we ended up in the current structures we have that aren't equitable and then that means people sitting with their own everybody go to therapy talk to a person right and be okay with like listening to like it, it's never the job of um black and brown people to educate us like educate yourself like go and get some books go on instagram go on whatever and educate yourself on like what you need to do right what we need to do and our own selves and then yeah it's acknowledging the structures that we've already created how is this affecting people what kind of harm am i bringing by making these choices by buying these brands by allowing myself to like take the easy way instead of like the comfortable way and i mean don't get me wrong i fucking love amazon but should i be ordering from amazon i don't know it's an ethical space and it's an ethical choice that um you know we're faced with on a daily daily um yeah daily uh tasks of like what we do how we do it mm. when i'm my daughter am i like how am I giving to her and to the community in a bigger whole? Am I really showing her um, a full aspect of leaders in America? Am I really showing her a full aspect of, um, of you know, like powerful American leaders, you know, things like that. Like, I just, uh, I think it's like broadening perspectives and relearning history and really learning ourselves and, you know, coming together yeah thank you for sharing about the roman empire and sex work and that in the building of putting out more and and normalizing these conversations about reality mm -hmm. yeah I, there's this amazing book fuck i wish i could remember i think it's called the history of prostitution um and it starts all the way back um like in roman days so, um, yeah, I mean, it's an incredible book, goes through all the centuries, all the way up to like, um, well, like, I think it was written in the 70s or maybe 80s. So it's an old book, but it's great. It's amazing. Mm. Um, yeah. So uh, that's what my, actually, me and my partner, it was one of our books, like we choose books and then he reads them out loud to me. <laughs> it was one of the, yeah, it was one of those books this one because he I mean he's like I'm just like a you know a kid like a fucking dumpster kid just like over here working all the time and I went to some college but I'm not like you know big Ivy League and my uh my partner is like he went to Columbia and he has all these like master's degrees and, da, da, da. and he's so sweet and he's he's not like pretend I know he's he's not pretentious or anything he's very kind and like very outdoors or whatever but it's things like that where I'm like let's use that degree can you read to me <laughs> you know so like you know and that's such a tangible example then of both of you sitting with it together and learning together and hit like I mean like yes I will read this book on the history of prostitution and acknowledge that this is the oldest profession and read this book about it yeah mm, yeah it's so cute yeah, it, supporter of, of sex work and obviously um he's been i mean sex work is is so challenging especially when you have a relationship and we have been through lots of hard times and lots of hard conversations um but the reality is is we stay i stay truthful and even when it hurts like i stay truthful um and we stay open and we talk a lot and um sometimes that means like you know fighting here and there and like you know just having conflict and um still choosing each other and still choosing to see each other and that's what I'm grateful for is because he's never you know slut shamed me or sex shamed me or done anything like that um it's always a conversation on like how it's affecting him you know mm 
Mm. Or like his feelings. It's never like how it's affecting him. It's like how he's feeling about it. It's never like, you're doing all these things and you're such a slut. And I'm like, you knew I was a slut. <laughs> but actually acknowledging like this is this is the small like this is a, the two one on interpersonal relationship version of again like that same pulling the string of all these conversations happening people being like okay i'm a human i have this experience i have this background with it let's talk about it right or him even acknowledging his own space of like ah oh, fuck i didn't even know i was trying to do that right there or you know i'm just gonna choose myself or choose my own pleasure or to make my own choices you know like it's um that's a really incredible space to start to move through because that's a huge stigma in our industry too is that if you're a sex worker there's no way that you could have a partner or be in love or have a family and um i have all of those things you know like i'm so in love with my partner and i mean we have an open space and an honest relationship and we have safe sex and um you know i still have clients that i see and um i have a daughter and we have a family and we're very wholesome like we're we're like so nerdy most of the time like we stay home we build gardens you know like we do art yeah we're outdoorsy like we we're just like um we do a lot of puzzles <laughs> you know like we're just a normal family that like lives and breathes and tries to support each other um and we do the best that we can to just every day show up for ourselves and for each other and i think that that's like i feel so blessed um and a uh, why a huge reason why I'm so open about my family and so open about my relationship and um, about the things that I do is because I think that a lot of sex workers in this industry don't think that they deserve that. They let, they settle sometimes for people that don't treat them right or people that um, put shame upon them. And a lot of times it's just, um, you know, not that sex work is for everyone or at every point of the life or whatever. Like I get the flux and flow and I get that it's challenging. Um, but I also understand that when you're in this industry, it's just so important to find your own value and to understand that you're worth like love and adoration and also compartmentalizing work from life is just, you know, more work. <laughs> yeah, boundaries, boundaries, mm -hmm. yeah your value and choosing to, to know your worth mm -hmm. and then surround yourself with people who support and uplift that and create yes. spaces that help people to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So important. It's really cool to get to see you doing something in your external creative work and learning and internal too, and getting to see like, okay, well, here's this thing that I was wanting and needing. So how am I gonna, how do I make and give that to other people? Right. Yeah. I, um, I went through a situation, my dad and my stepmom and all my siblings are very like religious and hardcore. And at one point, um, my ex-husband and I were super tumultuous and, um, I needed to leave because he was choosing alcohol over us and getting more and more and more violent and, um, and more passing out and more, you know, it just wasn't, it was super destructive. So he told my family, which tried to like take away my child with CPS and like, you know, it turned into this whole thing. And I mean, thank God, like $70,000 later, later in lawyer fees, like I made it out on the other side. Thank God. God that I was a sex worker because there's no way in God's green earth that I could have paid for a lawyer like that if it wasn't for what I did and the fact that I was working from nine until four in the morning you know like I had to. and that that was like a really devastating place because here I for years I had tried to hide it and I tried to hide it and I tried to hide it and um, I tried to hide who I was because it was always not enough it felt like and the reality is is the scariest thing that could have happened like my entire family turning against me um, that scariest space happened 
and then I made it out and I was like, I can fucking do anything. And I also understood that now that I was on the other side, I had to use my platform and my privilege to not hide and help other people not to hide because we deserve a space just as much as anyone else. And we deserve to be seen and we deserve to be acknowledged as good mothers and as good partners and as, as ex incredible people in community. And just because I do a certain job does not mean that I am a bad mother. It means that I'm a human being that's choosing a job. In my, in my case, choosing. Yeah. Mm. So I want to, yeah, that's, it, it is, it's all healing. It all comes from my own personal space of healing, which is the selfish part of the stripper project <laughs> where I'm like, no, everyone needs to see, you know, cause I, it did, it, it, it devastated me. It was so hard. And now like, you know, therapy later, like t tons of therapy later, and I'm still seeing a therapist and everything else to just help me with trusting people with, um, social anxiety with going out into crowds like I could be in front of a crowd of 2,000 people naked on stage totally good but going to the grocery store fuck that shit talking to my neighbors no way in God's green earth you know like things like that talking to other mothers that are not in the industry oh my god like panic attacks like just things that terrify me but things that I'm definitely I'm working through and it's just this like you know, response to my own space. And um, yeah, well, yeah. I, want, I want that platform for everyone. I want everyone to be able to be like, no, I can be proud to be who I am. And I can make this choice and still be valuable. Ooh, yes, that there isn't some choice that you can make that then strips you of your value as a human. Mm -hmm. and there's... Yeah there's the both sides of that too of like because of stigma against sex like you're talking about oh well how would I go talk to you know social anxiety talking to other mothers and yeah there's your own personal and your self journey stuff and there is the world structural like you were saying of the the founding of talking with mimosas being like hey I need to talk about my work because I'm a human but then of mm -hmm. course there's going to be anxiety to talk about that when they're structurally all of this set up to it's like yeah. how how to do well and it's like the co cultural norms of like how we shame each other so that the culture stays the same so that the structure stays the same that like whole idea that um you know, I, I have two reactions when I tell people that are not sex workers um, that I do like, oh, I'm a stripper. I always start with, I'm a stripper. I never, ever say like, oh yeah, like um, I do a lot of sugaring. Well, not a lot, but like, you know, um, I have like particular people that um, are in full support of me and I'm in these like beautiful loving spaces with them. And also it's like a agreement, you know? Um, and it, it's, you know, in the industry, we call it sugaring. So um, I, you know, I wouldn't go and be like, yeah, I do full service because blah, blah, blah. And, you know, these are the people like I do not like, I'm like, yes, I'm a stripper. And I have two reactions. One is like, mm, uh, okay, I gotta go. Or like, oh my God, what is the weirdest thing that someone has said to you? Like, what is the, what is the like most disgusting thing that's ever happened to you? Like things like that. And I'm just like, um, this question right now, this is pretty disgusting. Like, <laughs> I just, you know, like, the, like, you know, I just, it, and then it's like this whole like, oh, like how much money do you make? And how, like, what have you had to do? And what is the weirdest thing someone's ever said to you? And like, um, I mean, I get that my, job can be very interesting and intriguing and taboo to people but it's also just this understanding that what I do is private I don't talk about the people and what I do is also a skill like I'm a siren I'm a seductress I know how to um I know how to influence 
um, people in sexual ways. That's, that's what I do. So, um, yeah, those kind of things like make me a little terrified, you know, and I mean, just working through my whole family thing. Like I, I was co so dishonest for so many years and I swung to the opposite side and I was like very open and everyone had to know my business and everyone had to know what I was doing. Um, and that honestly did not work for me either. So I, I'm learning how to have better boundaries and that not everyone is um, deserving of my life, but also not everyone wants to know. And also, you know, I don't have to like spew everything. So I'm, I'm like finding this, the safe balanced space of the middle, <laughs> middle ground of living an honest life for myself instead of for other people. And then from that space, the stripper project was born and you're acknowledging like, Oh, you know, it's, it's, this is for my healing too. And I, Altruism is very selfish to me because it feels good to help people in some mm -hmm. part of our our being and I'm, like these things you're saying of shaming and the ways that people have that used to divide and to to minimize a lot of it is I, I wonder how much people are shamed from their own healing, doing their own understanding of themselves, their own like therapy being really taboo to talk about or like, oh, like yeah. these things of people being really curious about sex work. Oh, tell me, what is this thing or what's that? Or like, whoa, you, you have this experience? Like, I'd love to know. Then also not even conceptualizing, well, wait, that's minimizing this person's work when they're, what they're doing is work. That's putting more emotional and also time labor on them to be like, tell me about what you're doing to yeah <laughs> yeah i mean it's like so intense i i mean thankfully it, in a big way even with all of my social anxiety like i can hide there this is also the, i mean what's going on in our country right now and things to remember is like um you know black people are constantly especially if they are with like in all white spaces and they're they're you know it's all of that emotional labor that's pushed on and i again i ch i did i mean you can't choose to be black or not i chose to be a sex worker like i chose to to be in this space even if it is like on um like it it sucks but it is something that like i definitely chose like i mean not consciously i didn't know that this was a conscious choice that i was making but um, I definitely, you know, uh, I'm here because I chose it, yeah. Ooh. And you're talking about with, with work there or with the project or all of it? Oh, with, with work, you know, like I feel like um, there's things we can choose and things we can't. And um, this is, I mean, like uh, people um, kind of berating me because of like what I do. Um, it may be challenging and it's a choice that I made unconsciously because I didn't know that that was going to be a part of it. I didn't know that this was going to be, um, you know, I mean, when I started a long time ago, I felt like I could hide this forever, you know? Um, and that could, that was my choice until it wasn't a choice anymore until I was completely called out, you know? Um, and, uh, that I feel like is um, the this like reoccurring space in our own selves of um, if we're not like if we're we're stuck in a space where we're not choosing something is always chose for us. <laughs> Ooh, whoa! Not choosing is a choice. <laughs> Yes, there's no getting out of it. It's like being attached to non-attachment or it's, yeah, not choosing is still making a choice. And so choosing not to acknowledge something is still, yeah, you're still choosing something. Mm. Wow. Thank you for going all over here with me and going into like so many different parts of this and, and sharing. And um, it means a lot to get to have you and to have the stripper project seeds or stories of the seedlings like the to get that story on here means a lot to to my selfish healing and learning to 
to then see how what what that space can make for people to to sit down and be like yo what's it like in your humaning mm -hmm. yeah. yeah wow for yeah and thank you for sharing about it's so like i'm still that's so amazing about your daughter being like yo hey and and then what that says about the environment that that she was in to be able to be like yo mom hey mom mm -hmm. well they were oh. screaming I just like, it, it, there was resistance for me for sure. And then like, um, she just like, was like, yeah, I'm not taking this, you know, she just is who she is. Super powerful. Yeah. Mm. I'm really excited to watch the stripper project continue to, to go yeah. and be and, and to see the future spaces. Yeah. We're, um, we've been recording for about three years now and we are in the process of building our pilot. Um, and we are in discussion of contracts with streaming networks. So, um, our series will be up and going soon. Wow. Wow. Only in the next yeah, four to five months. Mm -hmm. mm, whoa. <laughs> I know it's huge. Wow. So fun. Wow. Yeah. I'm so excited to get to watch that. So soon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Probably, um, yeah, probably soon. So we still have so much work to do. It's just, so, of course, when I got into it, I was like, ah, we got this, it's good. And then, you know, just, ooh, had no idea how much work it was, but here we are, almost to the other side. <laughs> Full circle to resilience and coming back to, wow. Yeah, going through it and knowing that you're going to get through to the other side. Wow. I'm so excited to get to watch it. Yay. Yeah. yeah, it'll be good. All right, so people can find you at The Stripper Project on Instagram and thestripperproject.com. And there's the podcast that people can check out and the Stripper Church events on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Stripper Church events are for sex workers only. Um, for right now, we're thinking about having Ally um, Sundays, something like that, um, coming in the future where we're just getting together and celebrating or people are coming either from outside the community to give or outside the community to receive. So we're still in process there. So, mm -hmm. but it's coming. Yeah. It's all growing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you again so much for sharing your time. I really appreciate it and for your truth and honesty and all of it. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in and thanks for being you. <laughs>